scientists, are you ready to observe, explore, and discover? It's time for Fun Lab TV! From sunny Los Angeles, let's go to the California Science Center with your hosts, Mariela and Monica. Hi, scientists! Welcome to Fun Lab TV here at the California Science Center. Our show is made up of three segments that show you how science happens here, here, and everywhere. First, follow us as we guide you through our virtual field trip. Together, we'll explore the California Science Center and answer a question of the day. Next, we'll ask you to get curious and make observations in Check It Out. Wait, when do we do science? Well, you may be thinking that since this is a TV show, we won't be doing science. Ha ha! Think again, scientists. Our final segment is called Stuck at Home Science, where we explore a science concept with materials you can find at home. So scientists, that means you'll need some supplies. Don't worry, we'll give you enough time to get what you need. Here's a list of the things you'll need for the show today. While you watch, have an adult help you find what you need. Today you'll need a water station, a plastic bin or a sink filled with water, scissors, and any of the suggested waterproof items. Styrofoam plate, aluminum foil, clay or play-doh, straw, string, a plastic bag, and you'll need a pencil and paper or a notebook for the whole show to help you keep track of everything we discover. I think we're ready, scientists. On with the show. Hi, scientists. Welcome to Virtual Field Trips at the California Science Center. Before we get started, there are a few things we need to go over. field trips will have a question of the day and today's question is what do plants and animals need to stay alive this is the question we will be investigating today feel free to draw or write notes in your notebook to help you answer the question all virtual field trips will also have a buzzword today's buzzword is Environment. Anytime you hear this word, be sure to make check marks or tally marks somewhere in your notebook to keep track of how many times you hear the buzzword. Okay, I think we're ready for a virtual field trip. Let's go! This is our World of Life Discovery Room, made for scientists like you to come and take a closer look at a living thing. Scientists, since we are trying to understand what plants and animals need to stay alive, what better way to investigate than to observe animals themselves? As scientists, we understand that we are trying to care for animals in a place that is not their natural home, so that we can learn from them. We need to make an environment. An environment is all the living and non-living things in your surroundings that help you stay alive. But do all living things need the same thing? One way to find out is to observe animals. This is the enclosure for our skink. Do you see it? Skinks are the second largest group of lizards in the world, and they can be found all around the globe. Because the skink you see here comes from a more tropical forest habitat, we created an environment that looks like a tropical forest. This environment has lots of green plants and has different levels for the skink to climb on and explore. Let's check out the other enclosure. Well, I think it's in here. Hmm, do you see it, scientist? Oh, there it is. It's a sand boa. These snakes have thick bodies that they use to burrow in the sand. This type of snake prefers places with soft sandy floors 
so that they can easily tunnel underground. Most types of sand boas are found in places like a desert, so we created an environment that looks like a desert. There are not many plants, but lots of soft sand. Seems like the perfect place for this snake. Let's take a look at these environments side by side and see if we can find things that are the same. What do you see that's the same here? Hmm, this might be a challenge. I see that the skink has a lot of tall green plants, but the sand boa has only a few plants and a lot of sand. Oh, scientists, I think I found something that's the same. Do you see that? Those bowls have water in them. Why do you think the keepers have this water here? This must mean that animals need some kind of water source. Water is very important to have in an environment for animals to drink in order to stay alive. Do you notice any other things that are the same? Oh, scientist, I think I made a discovery. Look here. This skink has a special bowl full of veggies. This must be its food bowl. I wonder if we can find a food bowl in the Sambo enclosure. Let's go look. Hmm, seems like the Samboa doesn't have a food bowl. Does that mean it doesn't eat? Look, it's Louise, one of our keepers. Louise, does this Samboa not eat food? Of course it does. We just feed the Samboa behind the scenes. He doesn't eat in his enclosure. Thank you for that information. So scientists, animals need food, of course. In order for them to survive in an environment, they need food. And the keepers here make sure to keep our friends well fed. Wow, I feel like we learned so much by observing these two environments. So far, we learned that animals need water and food. I know where we can go see if this is true for all living things. Ready, scientists? Let's go. Okay, scientists, now we are heading into our ecosystems gallery. And here we have very different environments from the ones we just observed. Wow, scientists, all this walking and talking has me really thirsty. It's a good thing I stopped by a water fountain. Okay, let's go. Let's head out to the rocky shore. What perfect weather to explore our touch tank, where we have animals that guests can touch. Let's take a closer look at this environment. These are a few different kinds of sea stars that are found in our touch tank. Let me point some out to you. This is a knobby sea star. Here we have an ochre sea star. Bat sea star. Another sea star. While we have a variety of sea stars, they all come from a similar habitat. In the wild, these sea stars live in tide pools, which are pools of water left behind when waves crash on a rocky seashore. Here at the California Science Center, we have tried to create a similar environment for these sea stars. Just like all other animals, these sea stars need water to survive. But lucky for them, they live in the water all the time. Look at this sea star. What is it doing? It's moving closer to that white thing. Uh, now it's touching it. Now it's touching it with its little feet. Oh, I see. That's its food. Those little feet have suction cups at the end to help it bring the food to its mouth, which is right in the center of its body. Wow, look at it move. The sea star must be ready for lunch. Ooh, lunch. That does sound good. So scientists, just like the first enclosures, these animals also need water and food. <gasps> All this talk of food has my tummy growling, scientists. I just realized something. 
Just like the animals here at the California Science Center, I also need water and food in my environment to survive. So animals and humans all over the world need water and food too. But what about plants? I know another environment we can explore. And the best part is that it has plants and animals that we can observe. Let's go. Hi, scientists. I'm Amanda. I'm part of the education team here at the California Science Center. I heard that you have a focus question that you're trying to answer. I'm here in the Exploration Grove, and I thought maybe we could check it out together. Come on. First, do you see any plants behind me? Oh yes, those long, tall, green plants are called bamboo. They're the fastest growing plants on Earth. Now, the bamboo is not the only living thing found in this environment. Let's take a closer look. Don't be scared. Wow, scientists. I didn't realize that all these living things were here. I know you investigated some environments in the California Science Center. And just like those animals, these insects need water and food. This bamboo grove is a great place for them to find what they need. But what about what the bamboo needs? Just like animals, this bamboo needs water. How do you think this plant gets its water? Here at the California Science Center, we make sure to give our bamboo just the right amount of water it needs to stay alive. Plants work differently than animals. They use their roots to absorb water from the soil they grow from. Now scientists, let's take another look at the bamboo. Where do you think this bamboo eats? Do you see a mouth for it to eat? I don't see a mouth, but do you see all those leaves? Well, scientists, just like animals, plants also need food, but they don't have mouths like we do to eat the food they need. They use their leaves to get energy or food from the sun. Our building is designed to let sunlight come through so that the plants can have the light that they need. One of the cool things about bamboo is that the more sun it has, the quicker it will grow. And look at how tall our bamboo has grown. It's grown straight out of the building. Hope you had fun exploring with me. Have fun on the rest of your trip. Hi scientists. Today we are going to sing a song with some of my friends. Let me introduce you to them. These are the science songbirds. They want to share a song about what living things need to survive. This bird will sing first. You and I will follow along with this bird. Sing along with me and follow the moves that I do as we sing. Ready? Who eats food? Who eats food? Animals. Animals. Animals eat food, veggies, nuts, and meat. Animals like you. Animals like you. Who eats food? Who eats food? Animals. Animals. Animals eat food, veggies, nuts, and meat. Animals like you. Animals like you. Who needs light? Who needs light? Growing plants. Growing plants. Plants are living things. Plants need light to make food from the sun. From the sun. Who needs light? Who needs light? Growing plants. Growing plants. Plants are living things. Plants need light to make food from the sun. From the sun. Who needs water? Who needs water? Living things. Living things. Animals will drink it. Plants will absorb it. Water is life. 
water is life. Who needs water? Who needs water? Living things. Living things. Animals will drink it. Plants will absorb it. Water is life. Water is life. That was fun, scientists. Let's head back to the discovery room. What a great field trip. Let's go over all the things that we did today. We started our field trip in the World of Life Discovery Room, where we took a side-by-side -side shot of two environments created by the keepers here at the California Science Center to discover how animals in this place need food and water. Then we made our way to the touch tank where we plunged into an aquatic environment and found that living things here also needed food and water. We joined Amanda in the bamboo grove to discover the needs of plants there and discovered that just like animals, plants also need food and water. Finally, we sang a song with Mariela and the science songbirds about living things and their needs. Now scientists, can you remember the focus question? What do plants and animals need to stay alive? Can you answer the focus question using the buzzword? Environment. Okay, scientists, it's time to count our check marks. How many times did you hear the buzzword? Drum roll, please. And the answer is 14. We hope you enjoyed that virtual field trip. Don't forget these materials for stuck at home science. Now back to the show. animals in the ocean sea. Do sea stars have eyes? We have seen them on cartoons, but have you ever seen a real sea star's eye? Believe it or not, they actually do have eyes. Not like an eye like us, but instead they have something called an eye spot. But where is it? It's not on the top, it's not on the bottom, but it's on the end of its arm. Let's take a closer look. Do you see the slightly yellowish part on the tip of its arm? Since it's not a true eye like ours, it's called an eye spot. Unfortunately, the sea star can't see shapes or colors, but it can see light or dark. Let's take a second and try to see what they see. This is the top of our kelp forest exhibit. We can even see the divers getting ready to get in. Now if we were sea stars, this is what we would see. We can't really see anything, only light and dark, and shades in between. It's hard to tell if it's daytime or nighttime. Is that a predator, or is it prey making those shadows? Well, that's why they rely on their other senses to help them in their environment. Now let's go back to our normal eyesight. Oh look, there's the diver again. Not all of the animals in the ocean have the same vision as a sea star. For example, let's take a look at an octopus's eye. You see how the pupil is horizontal and spans the whole eye? This design allows them to see a panoramic view. By having this means they don't have a blind spot like humans do. Their pupil can also focus like a camera moving in and out. Having great eyesight allows this animal to do other amazing things like camouflage. Because the octopus can change the color of its skin and also texture, this allows the octopus to be a master in blending in with its surroundings. Another fascinating animal is our California halibut. It is a flatfish because it looks like it's laying on its side. But did you know that when they are born, they look like most other fish, and that they are right side up? As they develop, they will slowly shift so they will become flatfish. In this process, their eye that will be on the underside will migrate either around the head or through the head so that both eyes are on the same side of its body. And just like the octopus, they are a master of disguise. Can you find the hell of it? They are able to change the color of their skin as well so that they blend in with the sand. They are also very still and don't move except for their eyes. They are very observant and amazing predators. Have you ever noticed how most of the fish in our exhibit are very dull or neutral coloration? This is a defense mechanism and it helps them camouflage in with their surroundings. Not all fish need to blend in with their surroundings. For example, 
Have you ever seen a bright orange fish in our exhibit? This is the California State Marine Fish, and it's called a Garibaldi. The Garibaldi isn't a very big fish, but it definitely has a lot of spirit. They have been known to defend themselves and their nest with tenacity. They will go after other Garibaldis, other species of fish regardless of size, and even divers that enter their territory. That being said, they will not go after juvenile Garibaldis. The juveniles have special coloration that help distinguish from the adults. They are orange, but they have bright iridescent blue dots on their body. This is another reason why vision is very important to animals in the ocean. There are some fish that instead of blending into their surroundings, they do something called countershading. That is when there is a color contrast from the top of their body from the underside of their body. Usually the top of the fish's body is dark because if you look towards the bottom of the ocean, it gets darker. If you look at the underside of the fish, it gets lighter because if you look up, you will see the sunlight coming down. That was our giant sea bass and you can clearly see the contrast, but sharks are extremely obvious when it comes to counter shading. Here is our leopard shark. The top is dark gray and almost black, while the bottom is nearly white in coloration. This is an excellent example of counter shading. Sometimes you need good vision not only to camouflage in your environment or even for counter shading. There are some fish that will change colors based on if it's a male or a female. Here is our California sheephead. The females are mostly pink with a white chin. The males on the other hand have a black head and tail and a pink stripe down the center of their body. As you can tell, vision plays an important part of surviving in the ocean. I hope this gave you a better understanding of how animals in the ocean can see. Stuck at home science! Stuck at home? Let's do science! I'm standing here in front of our Wallace Animal Building where all our big lab field trips take place. Follow me inside. Welcome to our big lab, where scientists like yourselves can drop water balloons, watermelons, and eggs off of our tower, and even launch tennis balls out of our tennis ball launcher. And here in the big lab, we use model boats like this one to teach you scientists about buoyancy. Buoyancy is the ability for an object to float in water or air. When you place a boat in water, the boat pushes against the water, causing the water to move. The weight of the moved water needs to be equal to that of the boat, or the water won't be able to push the boat enough to keep it afloat. The force of the water pushing upward on the boat is the buoyant force. By adding weight in the form of a sail, we cause the buoyancy to change. However, if we use other boat parts, we can better balance our boat. The five major boat parts of our model boats are the sail, which helps the boat move across the water, the mast, which holds the sail in place, the hull, which is used for all our storage, the keel, which is used for balance, and the rudder to control the direction of our boat. Think of these parts as you design your boat. The sails on our boat are made of a lightweight fabric. The hull is made of compressed styrofoam. The keels are made of a hard plastic. Our rudders are also made of a hard plastic. Sometimes we like to use larger models like this one. Notice how I have to move the sail back and forth to catch the wind. I have to do the same with the rudder in order to change my direction. Now check out this scientist making her own boat at home. I'm gonna make a boat. Need a little bit more inspiration? Ask an adult to help you get to our website. This scientist is using foil for her hull, feathers for her sail, and a stick for her mast. What things can you find around your home to make your boat?
Thanks for exploring with us. See you next time. For more information, ask an adult to help you get to our website at californiasciencecenter.org forward slash funlabtv. See you there.